come and take your seats. Hope you're all doing. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Had a good week. Uh, there's a couple more just waiting in. There's a minute to. I think they're all in now. Grant, are they? Uh, yeah, I think everyone's. I'm rushing Steve Ibo to say evening all in the chat. I beat you, Steve. <laughs> 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 yes we normally have that uh we normally have that scrap right okay let I'll us uh <laughs> let's just get <laughs> right let me share my screen number two is a big number two on that screen so it must be that one good stuff good stuff uh right episode 41 uh 21st of march in case you've uh, not been keeping track so welcome along everyone uh so i hope you've had a uh, had a good week um so as usual as we go if you've got any questions uh please do pop them along in the chat and um uh, no doubt as we go through the talk there are going to be plenty of those so uh, uh and we'll um uh, hopefully get to a q a session uh, at the end uh we are recording tonight so uh, if you don't get it all don't panic uh you'll be able to come back and uh, watch it uh, at your leisure good okay so, uh, and of course, as normal, uh, we will uh, just keep you muted just to keep the noise uh, uh, down while uh, Evo delivers his talk. Okay, so um, then this evening we are joined by SGL member, um, Jaeger945, Evo. Um, and many thanks for, uh, for Evo. It's a very early start for him. Um, uh, at five o'clock, o'clock, the poor chaps had to get up and come and talk to us. So uh, we are uh, immensely grateful uh, to him. Uh, so Evo's been writing software since he was uh, about eight years old. Hey, who hasn't? Uh, um, won his first accolade from the uh, the Dutch Institute for uh, Industry and Technology at the tender age of 10 um, for a physics-related uh, program for uh, the MSX uh, home computers. Uh, holds an MSc degree from uh, University of Amsterdam uh, and is named as inventor on no less than 11 US and EU mobile uh, computing related patents uh, ranging from uh, artificial intelligence, user interfaces um, and network. Um, uh, Evo has a penchant for signal processing and multi-platform software architectures uh, and above all audio and visual engines. Um, and he's the author of the software we are going to see tonight, um, StarTools. Um, so as opposed to other uh, software, StarTools uses uh, GPU accelerated brute force and data mining techniques, um, uh, which sounds uh, incredibly interesting, uh, I'm sure, for, for most of us. Uh, so uh, Eva is going to give us a, a brief explanation of how Star Tools uh, came about, and how it was designed, uh, and how it's sort of different from uh, sort of the other mainstream software we're used to seeing. Uh, and then hopefully we're going to see um, a demonstration of the software in action as well. Um, and I think um, uh, I think with some um, IKO data sets, is that right, Grant? That's that's right, yeah. Excellent. Good. Good. Uh, so without further ado, then I will stop sharing. Clicking that button and Evo allow you to share. Thank you very much, sir. Awesome. Uh, so am I sharing? Everyone's Not seeing what I? Yeah. Not yet? Okay, Not yet. I'll, 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 sh I'll, sh I'll start sharing again. Uh, just a moment. Um, too many windows open. <laughs> uh, oh, bugger. <laughs> Come on. See all that talk. We've been talking about uh, tarantulas uh, and uh, uh, lizards and yes, all that sort of yeah, stuff yeah, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's put us right off. <laughs> Don't ask. All right, uh, here we go and share. That would be. Sure. Perfect. Is that working? Yep. 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 Awesome. Super. Excellent. So, um, all right, guys. Um, look, uh, this is a early start for me, so uh, bear with me if I fall apart. <laughs> I've only had one coffee. Um, I'm not properly caffeinated yet. So. Um, my name is uh, Ivo Jaeger. Uh, like uh, the intro just said, um, I'm essentially a signal processing nerd um if that 
is gonna play nice. Whoops. Come on, play. I'm a signal processing nerd. <laughs> uh, it's you know I live and breathe signal processing. It's it's what I do. I got started uh, doing uh, audio stuff um, and um, you know 3D uh, imaging, uh, 3D engines, that sort of stuff. And about 12, 13 years ago, I got started in uh, astrophotography. Um, so I'm gonna do a uh, just a short um, intro. Uh, you know, just with slides, because um, for the demo, just rather than just breezing uh, through the modules, um, I thought it's worth you know having a slightly deeper look at what's you know really happening. Uh, you know, under the covers, you know, what are we looking at? Um, you know, what what's the big deal? Um, you know, so if you're new to Star Tools, you may wonder, for example, you know, where are all the modules? You know, why is it looking so sparse? Why are there so few? Uh, well, why is that workflow so strange? It doesn't look like anything else, you know, I've seen before. Uh, why is it so short? Uh, and, and why does it do that particular thing uh, so quickly? You know, how does it do that? Uh, you know, and why are the luminous masks? You know, where are the support masks? That sort of thing. Um, so, so, but before we get into image processing, um, I actually got some laundry tips for you. Um, as I just said, I'm uh, a nerd. I have very few um, life skills, and um, it wasn't that long ago um, that I needed to do my laundry. And I had trouble with that, uh, doing that the first time. So, you know, I started doing a scientific experiment on how to do that properly. Um, so, you know, I tried a few different sequences. Uh, for example, I, you know, I just, you know, picked one and tried, you know, for example, drying my washing first and, and then, then, you know, uh, folding and ironing it and then putting it in the washing machine. But that, that didn't give me the right sort of result that I was after. Um, so if you're in a similar situation, um, uh, you know, this is apparently the right one. Uh, you might want to you know, screen cap this if you're similarly struggling. Um, so you put your washing into the washing machine first, then you you know you dry it, and then you you fold and you know you, you iron. Um, now I I got some shoes the other day uh, with laces for the first time, and I was sort of similarly stressing about you know um, how to deal with those. Um, those were um, Simpler, fortunately. Um, apparently, there is no difference. Uh, you know, there is no difference when you, you tie your shoelaces. It doesn't matter whether you you know start left or right; you still get the same sort of um, end result. Um, so it appears that you know some operations have to be done in a particular sequence uh, to get the right outcome. Um, so, and in mathematics, I remembered. Um, this is also known as a commutative property. So um, you get this weird thing where four minus two does actually not equal two minus four. The sequence differs, the, the sequence is important. Uh, but when you, you add two and four, you get the same result as you add four and two. So there's this, this is weird thing in mathematics that you know, sequence matters. And you know, if, if you're image processing, you, you come across this all the time. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure most of you guys know that, uh, and girls, uh, that uh, you, know, you need to perform certain steps and things when your data is still linear. Uh, you know, things like you know, gradient removal, uh, color calibration, uh, deconvolution, uh, et cetera. Uh, that's because if you would uh, stretch your image, then everything varies based on brightness uh, and you, you can't do linear op operations anymore. So, um, but, you know, other operations on the other hand, 
are perfectly useful when you perform them on, on, on stretch data. So, you know, this, this commutative uh, thing is definitely, uh, it's, 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 it's a biggie and you need to know about it if you want to do image processing. Um, so here, for example, you know, three images, you know, step one, for example, we've just um, uh, removed gradients and then, you know, we do our color calibration and then we perform some deconvolution. And, you know, all this needs to be done in the uh, linear domain, <clears throat> obviously. And uh, uh, you might, you know, I know what you're thinking. It's like, you know, number one there, it already looks stretched, you know, and I just said that, um, you know, everything needs to be linear, you know, but if everything's linear, you can't really see what you're doing because it's not stretched yet. So, you know, uh, that number one here is clearly stretched. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for that sort of thing, we, as you probably know, we have, uh, something like uh, a, a screen stretch. So it's, it's sort of like a, a hack to stretch just for display purposes, the data that you're seeing, even though the data is still linear. So just when it's about to be rendered to the screen, it performs a stretch. So you can actually see what you're doing, but the data at that stage is still linear. And this is, you know, essentially a kludge to temporarily get around that, 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 that problem of sequence. And that problem of sequence is a big one. And it's, it's, it's not talked about much. Um, there's so many kludges that specifically deal with uh, this problem of sequence. Uh, as a matter of fact, traditional processing, you know, as you would do in like a Photoshop or PixInsight, is rife with kludges to you know to correct or tweak or uh, you know hide um, artifacts caused by sequence-induced uh, inefficiencies. Um, like a lot of your workflow in those applications uh, is about dealing with sort of the fallout of that and, and cleaning stuff up. Um, and it's it made me sad when I started Start Tools, well, before I started Start Tools and just looking what's out there, you know, because I wanted to start processing my images um, as an astrophotographer or budding astrophotographer. And it made me sad seeing that, you know, if I wanted to learn image processing, it was more about you know, learning the clutches and, and not not about you know actually bringing out the the, the, the physics the astrophysics that, that that are going on um that, that's for the game second almost um so if you look at um a traditional image processing uh application um you're looking at you know you start off with some data and you stick that in operation one and operation one creates an output. And that output goes into operation two as the input of operation two. Uh, and so on and so forth until you end up with an image. You know, it's all linear, it's all input, output, next, input, output, next, input, output, next. Um, and what that does when you think about it, it's, you know, once operation one, the first operation is done, it just throws away its input. That input is, is gone. It's no longer needed. Well, you know, it's no longer needed, quote, unquote. Uh, so, and now operation two, you know, uses just the output from operation one. Uh, it has no idea what operation one used as an input. Uh, you know, it may have well been able to glean something interesting from that. And, and it, it actually can, and it actually does. Um, and operation two doesn't even know that there was an operation one that, that came before it. You know, it, and operation two doesn't even know where in the sequence it, it is, um, you know. Um, and all these little things, all these little cues, you can actually use uh, in signal processing. So all these cues, all, these, all this data that we throw away, it's actually useful stuff that you can use in your signal processing 
uh, to get a better result, either a better result or a better workflow, which uh, then leads to a better uh, a result because you get fewer rounding errors, you get fewer you know, um, interventions, essentially. Uh, now, the, when it comes to workflow, you know, the result is essentially that um, you keep sort of re specifying all these constraints that say, you know, well, I don't have that data anymore that you know, went into um, operation one and I'm now at operation three, uh, but it was something like this, you know, uh, and that something like this usually takes the form of like a uh, support mask or a luminance mask. Uh, and if you don't know what those are, that, that, that's fine. We can, yeah, we can learn about it later, but uh, the idea is always to supplement and, and sort of recreate that lost data. Uh, but th there's, there's actually a, a better way. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and I, I, I saw that uh, and I was like, how can I architect that better? How, how, can, I, how can we keep using that initial data and the in-between steps, you know, what, what can we glean from that? How can we use that to our advantage? You know, how can we even use knowing where we are in the sequence to our advantage? Um, so instead of having this dumb input, output, input, output thing um, that you know, is still created to this day and in, in even if new entries into astrophotography, um, I thought, what if we create like this sort of network thing um, where every operation knows exactly what uh, every other operation has done, uh, what every other operation uh, knew, uh, what every oper uh, other operation used as its input. Um, and you can even have an operation tell another operation to retroactively change this or that because you know uh, things have changed and now this is more uh, appropriate so what you end up with is essentially what i created in start tools now this is a mild math alert even if you don't you know if you're not a, uh, a buffon this is it's, it's not too scary so start tools actually implements this um, and the way it does it is um, it, it creates massive, long uh, equations uh, that describe the pixel that you're seeing. Uh, and these, these long equations um, encompass the whole processing uh, history. Um, so, um, by modifying and, and, and solving for parts of these equations, you can start doing stuff that should be impossible. And that, 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 that is impossible in other applications, uh, simply because you can intervene in the complete history. You can sort of uh, essentially time travel to, for example, when the, the data was were still uh, linear uh, and, then, and apply a deconvolution and then reapply everything that you did after, uh, uh, you know, you should have done your deconvolution. So if you just, you know, you did your color calibration and then you did your stretch and then you did some, you know, detail enhancement. Startles can actually go back to the time where your data was linear, insert that deconvolution in the right uh, way in the equation. So it all makes sense. So nothing is violated. Uh, and then recalculate the result. And you end up with deconvolution uh, on heavily processed data that just looks correct. Uh, now, don't worry if this was all gibberish to you, if, if you're not of that sort of mind, you know, that's cool. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people use start tools just because it's easy and it gets them from A to B. And that's cool if that's you, you know, power to you. Um, I just thought it was, it's, it's useful to understand what is special about star tools and going into the demonstration, you know, why, uh, things work the way they do. 
or you know why things just just work without even bothering you. So if you know if you you know don't care about all the, the mathematics behind it, you know there there are some real important benefits, um, you know, and they stem directly from the way you know, the, the signal processing works mathematically. So what you'll see in Startles is a, a do it right once approach. So what you have is, you know, all modules, and there's, there's, there's not, not many, but the ones that are there are extremely powerful and they always work for the task at hand. Uh, they don't replicate each other. So, you know, you're not gonna have, you know, multiple uh, denoise stages. You're not gonna have, you know, multiple uh, um, detail enhancement things that sort of get in get in the way of each other. Um, workflows are always predictable and replicable. Uh, presets always work. It doesn't matter what the data set is. Uh, and, you know, tweak upon tweak syndrome, you know, oh, just one more tweak, oh, maybe one more sort of, you know, one more stretch, one more this, one more that. It's not a thing in Startles. It, it, it does not happen. And, and it's, it's purely because everything just re, gets rejigged. So everything that you done before that is sort of discarded and then is rejigged and retweaked and simplified again. So the, the, the engine is constantly simplifying as much as it can that, that equation. You know, to save processing power and to make everything mathematically sound. Uh, you know, overcooking is just not a thing. Um, now, the other thing is that um, because we have the whole history at our fingertips, we can exactly see how the noise component of your signal changed from start to finish. So, uh, and you know, going from start to finish means that you know there's no intermediate uh, noise reduction that you need to do to you know help other algorithms along every algorithm knows exactly what the what the noise level is at any moment in time so all algorithms are noise aware they they will not exacerbate any noise grain if, if they can help it that is i mean you can you can push them um, you know, if you if you feel it, it should be pushed, but you know, uh, there's always this this baseline uh, that the algorithms have. That they know, you know, should not be crossed. Um, if something can be objectively computed, um, it is done so, uh, and that's why you won't find any luminance mass because, well, first of all, they're clutches, and second of all, they can be objectively computed if they are needed, because the whole processing uh, history is there. Uh, and the cool thing about the way Startles creates noise um, is essentially it's, a, it's an aesthetics issue. The only time that noise, uh, that you should be worrying about noise is at the very end when noise is at its most visible. Before that time, you know, noise is going to change all the time. Because you know you can stretch it a little bit more, you can enhance a little bit of detail. You know it's going to change. It's going to be squeezed. It's going to be exacerbated. Only at the very end is when you do your noise reduction, and it's an aesthetics issue only. It is not a signal issue, because Startles has your back. Startles knows exactly you know how noise is being um, uh, you know stretched and squeezed per pixel. Right, so uh, look, we're almost there. Um, I just want to sort of drive that point home, just, you know, comparing Startless Engine to something more traditional. And, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla is obviously, you know, picks inside, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the most comprehensive um, old style, engine that's the, that actually it formalized it has has it all formalized the, the objective processing um, you know everything is separated nothing knows anything about each other and everything has to be able to you know be plugged together and, as you see fit and that's one of the main reasons why i created uh start those because you throw away signal um 
so there's a it's, this startled user uh, alerted me uh, to this post in the Pix Insight forum where someone was sort of suggesting um, something sort of similar along the lines of, of startles and implementing that in Pix Insight. And there were so many quotes by the creator of Pix Insight that you know really put in contrast how Pix Insight works and applications like Pix Insight work and how they differ so much from uh, star tools. So for example, on noise reduction, you, know, you can apply noise reduction uh, to linear and nonlinear data using a variety of tools and techniques. Uh, and how and when you apply them depends on the characteristics of your data. Um, as happens with most non-trivial image process processing tasks, noise reduction must be guided by thorough qualitative, quantitative um, analyses that you must be able to perform efficiently and objectively. And this requires work, knowledge, and experience. And yeah, and that's, that's fair enough because you know, that is the case in, in old style engines. Uh, you have to be, stay really on top of your, your noise and how, how, you, you know, how it's being exacerbated. But contrast that with star tools, you know, the one and only time noise reduction should be applied is at the end of your processing flow when noise grain is visible in its final form. Uh, the engine will have the, the longest time to track and objectively analyze uh, the noise component of your signal as you process it. So it's, it's the engine doing the analysis uh, and keeping track of your noise. It's not you. Uh, and the denoise module at the very end uses this analysis to snuff out noise grain with pinpoint accuracy, but in a manner that you decide to be statically pleasing. You know, you're in control still. Completely, you know, on deconvolution, you know, uh, it requires you to first, you know, deconvolution requires you to first decide whether or not to apply deconvolution at all um, after a realistic evaluation of the signal and noise present in your data. And he goes on to say, the answer to this question is no, in most cases, uh, you know, your, your signal probably isn't suitable for deconvolution because you, you, you know, in, in in the traditional applications, you really need good signal for deconvolution to be able to, to work properly. Um, so you know, it's fair, it's fair enough. And he goes on to say, you cannot decide when to apply deconvolution in your workflow or move the deconv uh, deconvolved result across a stack of layers either. It only makes sense if you apply it to the integrated linear image, which is the very starting point of your final image. You know, going back to the start of this uh, slide deck, you know, do this stuff when it's linear. Uh, normally, you don't do anything uh, when it's stretched. You can't do that. And it, again, it's fair. Contrast that with star tools, you should always apply deconvolution. Always. Um, areas of sufficient signal to noise ratio will always exist in your image. Um, even if your data is marginal you know, around the stars. You know, even if it's just the stars, they will always have enough signal to noise ratio to at least clean those up a little. Um, you can apply a deconvolution at any time, uh, but applying it towards the end of your workflow after other detail enhancement will allow you, uh, will allow you to, uh, and it, uh, so you and it to better consider noise propagation and local stretching, and thus allow the engine to best suppress noise related artifacts. So it can take into account how you processed your image before it does deconvolution and thereby uh, suppress uh, you know, any effect that noise uh, propagation would have had. And finally, on the impossibility essentially of star tools, you know, uh, to work in a minimally coherent way, what you are proposing requires the complete recalculation of all individual processes in the processing history of an image after the process that you're modifying, obviating the fact that some of these processes would be invalid because their input data would be modified, hence requiring a new analysis and parameterization. This may require long execution times that pose a serious problem for an interactive or, or, or real-time tool. Yeah, uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> It really wasn't. 
But you know, Startless does exactly that. Startless works by constantly rebuilding, refining, and solving one long equation based on your processing history for every pixel that completely describes uh, the history of transformations, the source data into the image as you see it um, yeah, in the present. So by modifying or solving for parts of these equations, modules can time travel and solve and modify these transformations as needed uh, for their respective purposes in real time. So if you haven't tried Pix Inside, um, try it if you're interested in this sort of stuff, um, because it is, uh, you know, it is an excellent application. Um, maybe not the, you know, the, the post-processing side, but it, it, it has everything that's important in astrophotography. Uh, as it was 15 years ago, it was state of the art. You know, if, you, if you look at the, um, the algorithms in isolation, you know, they're, they're good and they're top notch. They're, they're really top notch, um, but they're in isolation and therein lies the rubble. Um, so um, even if you, you know, uh, don't use it for uh, post-processing, it's still extremely good for plate solving. It's, it's the best out there. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, its stacking capabilities are amazing as well. So I, you know, I'm not here to bag Pix Inside. Um, you know, I, I want you to support them because you know, the more you know, we support our developers, the better. Um, but I just wanted to to make clear the the, the con, you know the contrast and how different Startles is. So the demo that's about to follow, uh, you shouldn't try at home unless you have Startles. Because you know the the it doesn't make sense the the whole the processing flow doesn't make sense. We're going to be doing deconvolution, you know, after heaps and heaps of different uh, you know processing. Our color calibration will be at the end. It's it's uh, it's all over the place. Everything is topsy turvy. It's all over the place in a good way. So um, I'm gonna. If there is any questions, I can, can answer them now, or I can go straight into the uh, the demo. Uh, I can't see anything. Uh, uh, no questions of. Uh, of um, there was one from Gordon just asking oh, yes, about was, walking yeah. noise. Oh. Uh, walking noise. Yes. Uh, can I see that? Uh, it's just in the chat. He was just saying, "What is the walking chat. noise?" And I think in. Oh, what is walking noise? Okay. <laughs> Um, walking noise is um, if you have, say, a pixel in, uh, in your camera sensor or a photo site uh, that's misbehaving. Uh, for example, it's always on and it doesn't want to go off. Uh, so that's a, it's a hot pixel, we, we call that. Uh, or you know, maybe it's dead. Maybe it's not registering anything, you know, regardless of, of light coming in. Uh, a dead pixel. Um, and you start stacking those, um, and you just let the, the, the sky sort of you know, drift by, then you're gonna get a little trail because every time you take an exposure, the sky has shifted just a little bit mm -hmm. and shifted a little bit and shifted a little bit. You know, and your stacker tries to align everything properly and the end result is this little trail. Now, I most, Pixels actually, um, they're not dead and they're not um, hot either. Uh, sometimes they're warm or they're cold, uh, essentially meaning that you know, they're, the, the values that they register are just a little bit off. Um, so what you get is you know, not, not these huge distinct sort of stripes and streaks. Um, you just get um, less sort of defined, uh, you know, well, still streaks. I guess once you sort of start stretching your data, and that becomes quite um, apparent uh, when you do that. Now the problem with uh, stuff like that, like walking noise, uh, you know, there's this other type of uh, noise that's that's sort of similar. We call it pattern noise, and we call it pattern noise because it's um, it's uh, it's following a pattern. You know, whether it's a streak or it's a clump, 
or uh, you know, it essentially means that you know the these problem pixels are co-located. They're all in the same area, and they sort of follow a pattern. And patterns are really, really hard to deal with uh, by algorithms that are meant to actually enhance detail because they look like detail because they essentially are detail. So, and it's really, really hard for uh, algorithms and even people to figure out whether something is, you know, an artifact or whether um, it is actually real. And um, uh, that's problematic and it, it, it allows, well, it prohibits you from uh, pushing your, your data first. So what you want to do to counter this is, uh, for example, well, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing you can do is dither, which means that you sort of randomly move your, uh, your frame about, you sort of essentially randomly move your camera about mm -hmm. so that these, these um, hot pixels or cold pixels um, are no longer co-located. Um, so they, they move quite a bit. And then by using a stacking algorithm that removes outliers, they're really easy to identify, you know, by those algorithms. It's, it's really, really clear that they're an outlier. And, you know, the, the algorithm will say, you know, oh, we'll boot that and we'll boot that and we'll boot that. We'll keep this, we'll boot that. And you end up with a really clean data set. Uh, dithering is one, is after flats is the biggest thing you can do to improve your, your data sets. Uh, it's okay. night and day if you do that. Okay. Um, Excellent. Good all stuff. Right. All right, cool. All right. Let me um, move. Here we go. Are we seeing that? We are seeing startles. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, Okay, so what I'll be processing is the um, the Crescent Nebula uh, data set that uh, you guys put up, uh, that then uh, Icarus Observatory put up. Uh, it was a really nice data set. And I chose that because um, it, 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 it allows me to demonstrate a few really interesting things. So what I just launched, oh, <laughs> what I just launched is the Compose module. So this is a data set. Uh, it consists of three different narrow bands. Um, it consists of uh, sulfur, um, hydrogen alpha, and uh, oxygen-3 emissions, uh, otherwise known as the, uh, the show <laughs> or uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, uh, sort of not not pallet. Uh, I'm not going to call it pallet, but um, oh, what, what would you call it? A data set rendering composite, I should say. All right. So what I'm doing now is, you know, I'm just clicking on uh, the S2 here, and now the the HA. And the other three. And this slots the uh, the different bands into you know the different channels. So we're really following the Hubble Space Telescope um, uh, palette here. So we, we map red to sulfur, we map green to uh, hydrogen alpha, and we map um, blue to uh, oxygen three. Um, you sort of always do this if you, in Star Tours, you, you, you always do this if you have um, a narrow band in this way. Uh, you map it in, in this way and the, the reasons for that will become later, uh, become clear later. Um, now, this is a really unassuming module, but it's really quite powerful. Uh, this is already where the unorthodoxy sort of starts. Um, if you import something into this module, actually, if you import uh, something through Startles, even through the open functionality in, in the main screen, um, Startles will create 
a separate luminance data set and a separate chrominance data set, uh, meaning that it will create a synthetic um, data set that contains your detail and a separate synthetic data set that contains your colors. And again, the reasons for that will become clear um, shortly. Um, now, the reason why we have these exposure sliders here is for the purpose of creating these uh, luminance, uh, this, this synth synthetic uh, luminance. Um, so the exposure times are the same for, in this case, for all the, uh, all the bands. But if they weren't, you would specify them here. Uh, and then it would pre properly weight the, the signal to create uh, the, you know, your synthetic luminance. Um, there's a whole heap of different uh, modes for different types of uh, cameras and different types of situations um, that you can use depending on, on your needs. Um, I won't go into them right now. I would just look at the, um, uh, the documentation, which, which explains you know, when to use what. Um, but for now, we're just going to keep this. Um, this is a question that will uh, be asked every time you import something. Um, is this linear? Or has this been stretched? If it's linear, um, that's when uh, Startle switches into this whole uh, equation solving thing. Uh, if it's stretched, um, it'll allow you to try and undo the stretch if it's a, a, a specific stretch. Um, or you can uh, choose to not uh, uh, do the whole equation thing and then it, it sort of functions like Pix Insight essentially. Uh, just being dumb and just sort of uh, going from uh, you know operation to operation and not tracking anything. Um, so we just tell it, yes, this is linear. Uh, now this button here is lit up green. Uh, so that's to signify that tracking is on. So everything is being tracked now. Every, every little thing that we do is tracked. Everything is recorded. The whole history is tracked and used. Um, and now we can proceed to, to, to process this. Now you, you notice that um, things are, look, are, are looking black and white because uh, we had color before. We had, a, you saw some uh, I think yellow stars. And things are black and white right now because we're only processing the luminance. Um, we, we're not processing the color uh, so much. Color is, process it, is processed uh, in parallel um, automatically, and there's only a couple of modules that deal with the color. Uh, but all other times, uh, you won't even notice anything. So you purely focus on your detail from here on. So I'm launching Autodev. Now, Autodev is a uh, it's an extremely powerful uh, stretching tool. And it's something that uh, things are getting better, but uh, people sometimes struggle to get their heads around how exactly this works and what it, what it does. Um, essentially what it does is um, it catalogs all detail in your image and tries to create the optimal stretch that, that balances that detail in the uh, shadows, in the midtones, and in the highlights, um, not picking any favorites. Um, so it's trying to get the absolute most neutral stretch that it can um, to show everything equally. Um, so one of the things you can see, for example, if we zoom into say this, this, this bright star here, it's not bleeding. It's not bleeding into the next pixel. If I stars don't bloat, the core is still visible, still completely visible if, if you have a properly cal calibrated uh, monitor, depending on what you're viewing this on. 
Um, and that's, that's completely by design. Um, the reason why we started Autodev, we use it twice actually in, in, uh, in a workflow. The reason why you started in the first place is it uses that, that, that special detail, uh, yeah, bringing out all the detail um, for bringing out any issues with your data set. That's why we do it you know, straight up. Uh, because it's so good at you know, showing everything, it's really, really good at showing any, any, any problems in your data set. Uh, problems are usually uh, you know, having a, a, a big old um, light pollution bias, for example, uh, gradient, uh, you know, dust donuts, hot pixels, uh, cold pixels, uh, and you know, the perennial favorite um, stacking artifacts, which we do have here. So you can see this sort of, uh, these few columns here of pixels that are much darker than, than the rest, uh, they're stacking artifacts. Um, Startles is allergic to anything that is not real, does not like it. And that's purely because it, it needs to be able to uh, rely on everything being real. Um, if not, then it, it can get confused. So. What we do is you can just keep this stretch as it is. You don't have to do anything. And our data is now stretched for real. You know, this is not a screen stretch. So we can, we can work with it. Um, right now, I'm just going to crop those stacking artifacts away. So I'm just going to you know, leave some pixels at the borders, and that should be good enough. Yep, I think I got it all. It's a simple crop. Uh, now we can proceed. Um, I have to say this, this data set is really, really clean. Right? There's no light pollution gradients, which you, know, you typically don't get much light pollution gradients, um, narrow band. Uh, but there's definitely something in there, uh, which I'll, I'll show you. I just launched the wipe module, which is sort of the, if, you, if you've done your crop, um, you can choose to maybe maybe bin. Actually, I'll, I'll I'll show you. So if you if you process with startles, uh, and you know nothing about startles. Um, you can just simply use um, this. You can just go from left to right, top to bottom, and just follow all the way to here. So auto dev, um, you know, film dev is uh, you can sort of skip because it. Um, it's, it's a different way of stretching, uh, specifically to uh, emulate um, photographic film, which, you know, it's nice, but you know, it's, uh, it, it, most people don't use it. Um, bin is to uh, software bin your image, and Startles has a, a special uh, type of binning, actually. You can actually uh, bin with fractions. So, if your data, data set is oversampled um, to a certain degree, but not in integers, because usually in other uh, applications, you can only bin two by two, or you can bin three by three you know, in integers. Um, here you can specify exactly what scale you want. So you, you, can, bin, you can bin straight to um, how much, you know, the atmospheric conditions, for example, allowed at the night. And that always changes. Um, anyway, we don't need to bin here, really. Um, so, so we've skipped from Autodev to you know, bin. We've done our, done our crop. Uh, we're going to launch Wipe now. So Wipe is since Startle 7. Uh, it's, is, uh, it's essentially grown to become this is, uh, synthetic data set calibration solution. So it used to be that it was used for uh, removing light pollution gradients, but now it can uh, create synthetic uh, flat frames. You can create synthetic bias frames uh, or, or, or dark frames with it. Um, it's become really comprehensive with um, addressing any sort of calibration issues. 
uh, you can you can you can get by with not taking calibration frames at all, and Startles will do an okay job. Usually, uh, you shouldn't though. You should always use calibration frames. Uh, like I said before, it's one of the best ways of improving improving your data sets. But um, wipes come a long way in uh, allowing you to get away with that. Um, the first thing to know about wipe is that it restretches your data uh, visually um, and it will relentlessly show you everything that's wrong with your with your image um, if it looks like poo it, you know that's that's just <laughs> that's 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 normal uh, it, it sort of overstretches a little um, trying to show you every little bit of uh, you know, gradient that's still there, every little dust donut that may still be there. You should not take this as, uh, oh, you know, my, my, my data's bad. Um, there, you, you should not feel obligated to stretch as much as wipe is doing right here. You know, it's perfectly okay. You know, essentially uh, not hiding the issue, but you know, the issue will not be as prevalent if you if you sort of stretch this properly using, for example, Autodev. Um, I'll show you what uh, Wipe did because the data set, the, the, the luminous was really clean, but what it did with color. This is one of the few modules that actually deals with color in parallel as well. So this is our chrominance data set that we're looking at right now. Um, this is really sort of uh, an expected. Uh, color rendition at this stage because uh, hydrogen alpha is always really, really strong. Uh, we've mapped hydrogen alpha to green, so green is, is, is really strong. You can see a lot of uh, O3 here, by the way, which is nice. Um, so, and I'll show you what it actually did. So, this is what it looked like before. So, there was a massive bias in our, in our, in our Chromans data. So, it, it definitely did something. <laughs> Um, I can see a little bit of red poking through here. I might see if I can get rid of that. Yeah, so I, that went away. You, just, you can see how that red over here went away. And that was because there's some anomalous data there. There's a dead pixel there somewhere that is darker than the real background. And if something is darker than the real background, um, wipe will back off. Um, it will back off because it doesn't want to clip your data. So if it, if it creates a model to subtract, um, so you know, it created the model to subtract that bias. Um, it creates the model in such a way that it will never clip your data. Um, I had to bump up this, this, this value here, the dark anomaly filter to filter out that dark anomaly before passing it to, to wipe. Um, so it essentially blind to that dark anomaly that's, that's here somewhere. Uh, so th this looks quite clean. Now I should also explain how wipe is very, very different to something like, you know, DBE and Startles or uh, the, 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 the sample setting uh, stuff you find in Serial or uh, APP. Um, in all those applications, you create, you're, you're essentially in charge of creating a background model, uh, essentially about setting samples that you feel is background. Now, the problem with that is that if there's still a bias or a gradient in your data set, you cannot actually properly see whether there is background. You're sort of, sort of stabbing in the dark. Um, and what happens is that you typically inadvertently select real detail as background. And what happens then, if that gets into your model and that real detail, you know, faint, faint nebulosity, that sort of stuff, gets subtracted. 
as well, and then it's gone. And that is one of the problems that I really wanted to fix. Um, you know, a good example is, uh, let's say the M81, M82 pair, you know, the Cigar Galaxy and, uh, and boats. Um, there's a lot of uh, faint uh, interstellar uh, flux nebulosity there in between those galaxies. And it's so easy to destroy that with sample setting because it's so faint and you can't properly see it. So Startle's wipe module works completely different. It sort of works the, op the opposite way. If you even need to, and often you, you, know, you don't, you can tell it what is absolutely not background. So if you're sure that you know, something is definitely not background, you, you can tell it so. And uh, it will make sure that you know, nothing gets subtracted there. It, it's not going to end up in the model. 99% um, of the time, you actually don't need to do that. Um, for all the rest, um, it uses a completely different algorithm that works by looking at gradient undulation. Uh, so the reasoning is that gradients undulate pretty slowly across your, your field, whereas nebulosity, uh, you know, it, it varies from, 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 uh, from pixel to pixel much, much quicker. Um, and by sort of sorting uh, these two out, you can really effectively uh, figure out what is a gradient and what isn't. So there is no manual sample setting here. There's no guessing of you know, what is background, you just leave it to the algorithm. Uh, and that really helps as well in cases like these, for example, where there, there is barely any background here. You know, I don't know where you would place a sample here because there's, there's just, it's nebulosity all around. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things that are completely different in star tools by design. So I'm not, I'm not just gonna keep the, uh, the, the white result because we gotta move on. I'm launching Autodev again. And this time I'm launching Autodev with a view to actually use this stretch as the basis to enhance detail on. So we fixed all the issues that were here. You know, wipes uh, uh, subtracted the uh, any gradients, any biases. And now we're left with the pure celestial signal. And that's where you want to be. That's, that's, that's your, your place to start. Um, now that we have this celestial signal, um, we can just you know, inspect it a little bit more. It already looked good. It already looked fine. Everything is perfectly balanced. Everything is, everything is showing um, optimally within you know, the dynamic range of you know, black to white. Um, there are no blown out highlights. There are no good blacks. The faintest stuff is showing properly. Um, this is a good basis to start. And that's all the devs uh, job in this case is to give you the place to start. Yeah, it's, it's not to uh, pick any favorites yet. It's not to you know, create, uh, to, you know, to use levels and curves like you would do in other places to, to start enhancing things. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly show you what you can do with the uh, region of interest. So you can actually tell Startles to um, optimize the stretch, not for the whole image, because you know, sometimes the whole image isn't that interesting because it's just you know, sort of empty background. Sometimes you just, you know, are interested in the, uh, the in just the object, so you can tell it to hey just just look here and all the other stuff is not that important. Um, and by not that important, you can actually set a percentage of you know how not important the rest is. Um, so if you have, for example, a, uh, a galaxy on an otherwise uninteresting empty background, you would typically just select the galaxy and just leave the background uh, alone. Um, if you have two galaxies, for example, you have M81 and M82, like I just mentioned, 
um, you pick the brighter one of the pair, uh, simply because that has the uh, you know the, the highest dynamic range, and we want to solve for a dynamic range that works for everything. Um, all right, so I'm going to say no region of interest because the whole image is interesting. You have nebulosity everywhere. Um, you know, and then I'm, look, I'm just going to, essentially what I said before, I'm just going to follow left to right. Yeah. I'll show you what the contrast module does. Um, it's nice. It, 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 the contrast module works um, optimizing contrast in large scale areas. So it, it's not about you know digging out details so much. Uh, you know on a pixel by pixel basis. Um, it works over large areas to make things just that little bit uh, easier to look at. So for example, here, you know, it's it's darkened this area a bit, and it's brightened this area a bit. It's subtle, but it just makes things just a little bit easier to see. You know, and you can completely overdrive this effect, and you can make it more local. You know, you can try the different presets. You can, you can go nuts with it. Um, but you know, the, the presets. Uh, like I said in the presentation, they tend to do a, a decent job for uh, just you know, uh, common use cases uh, like this. So the HDR module is um, essentially the contrast module, but for the nitty gritty. Yeah, so it, it's about enhancing the small detail rather than you know, the large scale stuff. Um, it's subtle. And the thing is, it's subtle because that's all the data can bear. Startle knows exactly how much you know, it can enhance before things get out of control and artifacts start popping up and you know, how much and, and before um, you know, noise grain starts popping up. Again, you, know, you can completely overdrive this if you want. You can go nuts with it if you want, but you know, um, easy does it. So I'm just gonna take the back. You know, play around with the uh, all the different uh, algorithms that you know enhance the the, the local detail differently. Um, have fun. There's there's no wrong or right way of using this. Yeah. It's, it's it's up to you and what you think is you know is acceptable in terms of you know uh, detail and, and, and enhancement. Um, for our object here, you know, it's definitely visible. Things pop out a little bit more, and you know that that's what I'm comfortable with. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and, and keep that. Um, so all I've really done is I've just launched you know, the contrast module, kept the defaults, I've launched the HDR model uh, module, kept kept the defaults. And honestly, I'm just going to do the same thing with the sharp module. Now the sharp module is some of you might be uh, familiar with uh, wavelet sharpening. Uh, some of you may have used it with uh, in planetary, for example. Um, Registax has wavelet sharpening. Uh, you know, it's, it's a nice way of um, enhancing, you know, the cloud decks of Jupiter, for example. Um, but you have to be really careful with um, with using it. It gets out of control really quickly. Um, one of the things that wavelet sharpening in Startles does is it takes a mask uh, just to protect the stars. And I just said auto generate masks, and that's already done it. It's, you know, it's got the masks, it knows exactly where the stars are. You don't have to do anything uh, if you don't want to, uh, and I don't want to. Um, so 
it's, it essentially helps the stars, the, the, the sort of the halos, the, the stellar uh, profiles uh, from not being accentuated so much because we're not really interested in, in that. If anything, we want to dim them down a bit, maybe. Um, other than that, it's again super easy to use. It knows exactly how much and where and what. Um, so it's already done it. It's already enhanced what it sort of think it could. If you look at the background, there is no noise grain exacerbation whatsoever here. And it's just enhanced the, um, the, 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 the structures in the, uh, in the areas where there's actually enough signal. You know, again, we can, we can overdrive this. But even if you overdrive it to something ridiculous, the result is still usable. And, and that's, that's, that's the important thing about star tools is, is getting stuff that's, that's, that's usable. And the way it does it is it has a baseline that you can vary from. It doesn't, it's not an absolute thing. It's a relative thing. It, give, it, it starts with the middle of the road thing and let you tweak from those settings using the parameters. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't throw you in the deep. You know, it doesn't give you weird parameters that you need to find a sweet spot yourself. And that's purely because it can, because it has all these statistics at its, its fingertips. Um, now look, this is a really strange and wonderful implementation of wavelet sharpening, because wavelet sharpening like I said, usually results in heaps of artifacts, uh, lots of ringing, uh, noise exacerbation. Um, here, there you have two really interesting things that you can do that, that really sets it apart. Um, you can actually tell it what happens. So I'll, I'll explain really quickly what wavelength sharpening is. It, it is essentially chopping up your uh, image into features of different scales. Um, so in this case, it's five different scales. Uh, you have stuff that's really big, you know, like uh, for example, um, spiral the, a galaxy. A galaxy uh, is, is big. Um, then you have stuff that's a bit smaller, let's say the, the, the spirals. Uh, then you have stuff that's even smaller, uh, let's say you know, little gas knots and, and so on and so forth. And wavelet sharpening actually allows you to um, sort of recomposite and throttle uh, these different scales. So you can bring out features of different sizes. That's what wavelet sharpening is. Um, the thing is, Startles gives you control over what happens if two scales fight each other. And by fighting each other, I mean, if one scale feels that, you know, oh, I should darken this pixel, and another scale is, no, 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 we should, we should brighten it. We should sort of show, the, show the knots. Then you can control uh, who wins, essentially. Um, and you can do that um, even based on the uh, signal to noise ratio in a particular area. So right now I've weighted this bias to be really towards the, the smaller bit, bits. So most of the time the smaller scales win because for, and for this image that's, that's appropriate because you know, the, we have a lot of, sort of small intricate detail here. Um, I can, you know, weight it more towards the, the bigger stuff, see what happens. You can now see that, you know, the bigger scales get enhanced rather than the, the smaller stuff. Um, in, in areas where there's no fighting, you know, it, it, it essentially just works as before, but you now have control over what happens. You have more fine control over what happens when, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they start fighting each other. Um, now the reason why 
you have control over the, the different signal to noise ratio areas is because typically the signal to noise, uh, low signal to noise ratio areas, they don't have enough signal to um, enhance the finer stuff. Um, yeah, things get noisy there. Uh, and even if you, you know, bump this up, nothing probably will happen. You'll just see less actually. So, but if I say, you know, the most important thing is the, is the, the bigger stuff, you should see, see a slight, yeah, that's slight. You see a bit here, you see a bit there. Um, anyway, it's have a play with it and you'll get a good feel for what it does. Um, this is, could be a good example. Yeah, so it's, it's accentuating that a bit and accentuating that a bit. Um, yeah, again, have a play with this. Um, I'm just gonna go with the defaults because I think they're appropriate. I'm happy with that. Because the big one is yet to come. So now that we've done this, we're gonna do something that's just completely weird in other applications that you should never do. We're only gonna apply deconvolution now. So, uh, you know, remember how deconvolution, you know, you can normally only perform on, on linear data. What we've been doing is, you know, we stretched it, you know, we've, we've manipulated the large scale detail, the small scale detail, we've done HDR manipulations, contrast, you know, the whole caboodle. Um, but it doesn't care. It really does not care. There it is, it just snaps into focus. It really does not care. It, it has, you know, gone back in time, applied deconvolution, you know, reapplied every, all the other stuff that we did, all the contrast, all the HDR, all the, the other bits, uh, and came up with this. Um, now the, the effect isn't as dramatic over a, uh, over a casting service like, uh, like Zoom. But um, on your monitor at, at, at home, when you do this, everything just should snap into focus. Uh, notice also how quick it is. That, that, that was it. <laughs> that was it. Done. Yeah, you can throw more iterations at it, but the probably won't do much, I uh, don't see any difference. Um, you know, that will make it slower, but, um, uh, whoops, stay here. Um, so let's just apply this to the, uh, the whole image and see what we, what we got. It shouldn't take too much time. And yeah, like, uh, like was said in the, uh, in the, the introduction, it's, it's GPU accelerated. And that's been such a huge game changer for StarTools. Just having um, GPU acceleration being mainstream, and it hasn't been that long where it's been sort of mainstream and everything is mature enough to, to do this. Uh, so it's been GPU accelerated for a year. That's already done. And um, you, it, it just allows you to really quickly experiment with different settings. You know, you don't have to wait. It's, it's almost real time with a, with a small enough preview. And it's, 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 it's wonderful. Um, so I'll show you one more time before and after. Before, after, there's a lot of intricate detail that's come out. And you notice there's not an artifact inside, no artifact whatsoever. There is no exacerbated noise, there's nothing. And 
there is no mosques, there's no support things, there is no, you know, there's no subjective anything that you need to deal with because everything is objective, objectively done right. So look, that's uh, that's deconvolution. Um, it's super easy to use. Um, I got a. Um, I've been looking at a development version for the past few months that has a completely new deconvolution module that's even better than this. <laughs> Hold on to your hats for that one when it comes out. Um, it, it's it, that one is going to be really really special, doing stuff that hasn't been done before. Um, so that's the convolution done. Uh, that's all there is to it. Really quick, really easy. Um, so now the interesting bit about color. So what we're doing now is I just launched the color uh, module. Uh, again, completely weird sequence because normally you do color calibration uh, at the very start. You know, because again your data needs to be linear when you do your your color calibration, um, not in star tools. Um, so this is the, the default here, um, which is not uh, suitable to um, uh, narrow band. Um, this is like a visual spectrum sort of uh, default, uh, you know, but as in all modules, we just have a preset that, you know, dials in the right settings to you know, get you in the right direction. So um, that's sort of more like it. It's closer. Yep. Yeah, that's not too bad. Um, so what's happening here is it's taking the detail that we processed and taking the uh, chrominance data that we had, that we fixed that bias. Uh, uh, for uh, during the wipe and merges them together. And what's happening here is that the detail will not change at all. It's just the color. If, you're, if your screen is properly calibrated, you should not see the detail change. Color should not impact. It doesn't matter what sort of color you choose. Color should not be impacting detail um, to the best of its abilities. That is, I should say, um, and and usually that is the case. So detail should be the same. Now you you may have heard of like uh, color preserving stretches, um, uh, area hyperbolic sign, uh, you know, arc, arcs in H. It's called um, to. And, they're one of those clutches that try to stretch color information along with the detail and, and you know, and then you're limited with the way you can stretch just to be able to preserve your colors. And you know, none of that applies here. That's all abstracted away. You have this complete separation, this complete freedom of doing what you want to do. And I'll, I'll show you what sort of freedom that is, because you can choose from a vast amount of uh, popular um, remappings. So remember how in the compose module we uh, we started off with you know mapping everything to the the, the show or the the, the the whole space telescope uh, palette, you know solver for red. Um, hydrogen alpha for green and oxygen three for blue. But, you know, I can now say, you know, eh, after the fact, yeah, I'm not too happy with that. I'd rather have something like this. That's nice. I like that. Um, so, and that's a, you know, that's a complete remapping of the coloring, again, completely without affecting your detail. So it's a, it's a recompositing after the fact. It's a perfect example of that time shifting sort of thing that makes Startle so special. Um, 
you know, as a matter of fact, I kind of like this. <laughs> um, there's heaps of other stuff that you can experiment with uh, here. You know, you can obviously try all the different uh, blends. It's also super easy if you do like, um, oops, that's the same one. Uh, let's try something else. It's super easy to do uh, nice pie colors as well, uh, for example. And just uh, by throttling the, the red bias and green bias and blue bias, you're actually throttling the contribution of these bands. Um, so you can actually make you know, oxygen three poke through or you can make hydrogen alpha poke through um, because it's all properly it responds linearly. So it's really um, intuitive, particularly when you're doing uh, bicolors that, you know, that uh, sort of pink uh, cyan bicolors. Um, I think Al McLean has a nice example uh, of that in his background. It's a really nice uh, field nebula there. <laughs> so it's the, uh, yeah, that, that red and, uh, and cyan. Uh, super easy to do with uh, with star tools, and you know if you happen to not like what you what you got, then you can easily remap it just like that with a single click. Um, so look, I'm just gonna go with uh, this is always a sort of a a nice one. Doesn't really matter for this for the purpose of this demo. It's just like the sort of golden and blue that we're used to seeing in Hubble stuff. Yeah, that's right. You know, and you know, you could at this stage you could decide to leave it at that if you if you wanted to, because um, it's you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's 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 already a nice image. It's showing good detail. It's showing nice colors. It's, pretty to look at. Uh, the only thing is that you know, the, the, the stars are pretty sort of, uh, prominent, uh, which you, know, you can solve fairly easily using this module and others. Um, it sort of does what it says on the tin, it shrinks your stars. <laughs> it doesn't get easier than that. <laughs> and just different ways of uh, shrinking your stars is uh, there's functionality for uh, attacking halos. It requires a bit of experimentation, but um, also you, you wanna be careful to protect your uh, your, your detail a bit better because while it is pretty good at, at sort of not attacking detail too much, you can sort of see small bits of nebulosity being uh, being affected here, which is easy. You know, you, just, you either just touch up your mask like that. You know, you just click off the bits that you don't want it to. effect uh, or you know if that's too tedious uh, you can reconfigure the the auto mask generator as well and there's there's some stuff in the documentation on, on how to uh, reconfigure the auto mask generation to ignore for example uh, features of a particular color uh, or features of a particular size that sort of stuff um, you know all in all it's doesn't take much time I'm just going to keep that for now, just to move things along. Uh, so one of the, the things that is new in 1.7 is uh, the superstructure module. Uh, you can think of the superstructure module that replaces the life module that we used to have. You can think of that module as it's like a wavelet sharpener for extremely big detail, like for, 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 for massive structures in your image. And when you can isolate them, you can start manipulating 
them versus the other stuff in your image. So you can, for example, decide to um, dim all the other stuff that's not part of a superstructure. Or you can say, I just want to brighten everything that's in a superstructure. Uh, or you can say, you know, I want to uh, bump up the saturation for everything that's in a superstructure. And that gives you some really uh, powerful new ways of uh, manipulating an image and sort of guiding your, your viewers' attention to what's important. Because typically what's important is you know, the superstructure. So in this case, the superstructure is this. And what you can see is it's pushed back that busy star field. But it's kept this pretty much intact. And now this seems much more uh, volumetric. I mean, you can throttle this, this effect to your, to your liking. But you can see the superstructures in the background that were previously sort of obscured by stars, they, they start popping out a bit more. You know, and it's up to you how you want to throttle this or, or use this. Um, you know, you can, like I said, you can, for example, decide to saturate this superstructure here. So you'll notice that the rest of the image isn't getting saturated much. It's just, you know, areas where there's a superstructure. And it's, it's a really nice way of, um, you know, making your image pop or drawing the attention to uh, superstructures, which are almost always the, the, the more interesting bits of your image. It's, 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 a, it's a really nice, um, I can brighten it as well, for example. Let's see what that looks like. So it's brightening that and this and that, but not, not, not so much here. So yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice way to add that little bit of extra flourish or, or oomph to your, um, your, your image. Um, it's it's a, a absolute processing hog though, but um, it's just thanks to GPU acceleration, it's not too bad now. <laughs> so look, I'm just gonna go with, with the default that I launched with. So I've, Essentially, it is gone with mostly defaults for, for this image. It really is as simple as, you know, click, 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 and yeah, and you're, you're sort of there. Now, normally, you know, I, I would wow everyone with you know, the amazing capabilities of, you know, of the noise reduction. But the problem is with these data sets, they're so clean. <laughs> you're so good. There's, there's, there's bugger all noise in there. So, um, yeah, I can still give it a go, but, um, and that's sort of why I was thinking of maybe processing a, a more, a, a noisier data set after this, if there's time and if people are still interested and in not asleep, it's probably getting late there. Um, yeah, there's, there's very little noise to begin with. And it probably doesn't translate well with the compression and all. So it, honestly, it just doesn't even need it. So yeah, just happy with this image. And uh, yeah, you could publish this or do whatever you want with that. So look, that, that's our first sort of uh, image process. Um, if, if anyone wants to ask a question or comment or now's a good time. You, you've blown my mind for a start. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I can find an image with plenty of noise in. That's uh, that's not so much of an issue. Um, <laughs> uh, Evo, there's uh, there's plenty of chat going on around uh, uh, around the whole um, the whole graphics processing uh, capacity and what that actually means. Uh, and obviously, there's a, there's a myriad of different configurations that, that people's PCs are going to have. Uh, oh, I, yes, mys yeah. I myself, I've got two cards that are linked. Uh, some people have mm, got nice. um, com um, uh, uh, onboard uh, yep. uh, graphics yep. memory and all that sort of stuff. Could you just give us a, a quick overview of, of of what they of what the what the whole GPU sort of bit means in Star Tools? 
Otherwise, yeah. we'll end up with 150 questions all with individual configurations. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. First and foremost, um, if you want to run out and get a uh, graphics card right now, it's a really, really bad time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah you, most people know, but you know, some people may, may not. Uh, cryptocurrency is, is, is booming again, and it so happens that um, that runs on graphics cards and you know, all the crypto miners are buying them up. So um, there's a good chance that you won't even be able to get one. Uh, but if you will be able to get one, it's usually at hugely inflated prices. So um, just just make do with what you have. And that's the thing. Most people these days, and I said, it, said this before, things have matured now. And most people have some sort of... Um, a graphic acceleration solution in their PC right now. Um, like you said, whether it's um, uh, whether it's onboarding uh, onboard uh, GPU um, or you know just uh, your your uh, discrete display adapter, mm -hmm. um, most of the time startups will work with them. Okay. Um, if not, um, you can usually get them to work and if that completely fails then you must have a really really old card um, anything from the last uh, 10 11 years should work so and that covers most people uh, and again if you have trouble you know there's usually a way of, of getting them to work uh, in terms of you know what particular card does for you um, even the middle of the road uh, sort of gaming card from say five, six years ago will get you massive speed ups uh, compared to you know using the CPU only. Uh, you know, de 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 depends a little bit on on what the module does, mm -hmm. but something like uh, deconvolution, you can see speed ups uh, in the range from anywhere from three times to twenty times. Uh, it, it, it really it really is huge, and it obviously depends on you know, how powerful your CPU is yeah. and how powerful your graphics card is, what the speed up is going to be. But um, and even for uh, you know, iGPUs or, or, or onboard GPUs, um, you will notice some speed up. Uh, depends a little bit on how recent your I, iGPU is. Um, sometimes you will barely notice a difference but um you know at the end of the day any sort of speed up is yeah it's good <laughs> so sure yeah absolutely um uh, uh like i say there's, there was a there's a fair few uh, questions around that so uh, so hopefully guys that um that will uh, will answer uh at least if not all of the um, uh, those questions otherwise i think we'll be here for some time just looking at the at the gpu questions but um, <laughs> okay uh so there was a question came up. Um, Aaron Small, um, when processing Star Tools from my modified digital SLR, I tend to get a pink color when it should be deeper red. How can I correct this? Ah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a common one. Uh, there's actually two common questions around that. Um, around uh, processing with Star Tools, one has got to do with stars, and the other one's got to do with uh, that pink color. And the thing is, the pink color is actually correct. If you, you know, if it's a visual spectrum data set, that is, um, if you image, for example, uh, any, any H2 area, you know, uh, like, a, you know, H2 areas are sort of the stellar nursery type uh, areas. Um, there's a lot of hydrogen there. Um, there's a lot of, you know, young, powerful blue O and B type stars that power these complexes and, you know, and create all these emissions. Most of the time, these emissions are hydrogen. And, but when you excite hydrogen, uh, you know, most people will think that hydrogen is red, but that's only one, um, that's one, only one state that's hydrogen alpha. You also have hydrogen beta. You have you know, you have delta, gamma, epsilon, and um, eta. But eta is getting sort of in the in the UV part of the spectrum. Um, 
But all the other ones, you know, starting from beta, they're blue. Um, they're not as prevalent and they're not as uh, bright, typically, and you know, and they require slightly higher energies. But if you mix that with the pure red of hydrogen alpha, you get exactly that pink. And the thing is, you see that pink a lot in Startle's renditions because, you know, it, that science, if, if, you, if you repeat an experiment, you expect, this, expect the same outcome, you know, regardless of who does it, you know, what sort of, you know, uh, gear you use or, or where it's done, or, or, you know, what the, you know, whether you did a little dance doing it before, you know, those little things shouldn't matter. You know, the only thing that matters is you repeat the experiment, you should get the same outcome. And you do, I start with, you always get that sort of pink rendition in, in visual spectrum data sets. So, um, and what I mean by that is data sets that um, um, typically have like a, 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 a luminance filter uh, in front of them. So that's a UV cutoff and an infrared cutoff. So, um, and that sort of response uh, yields uh, typically a pink for those sort of areas. Like having a, like a really deep sort of red is, is quite rare. Uh, yeah, you know, most of the time you get uh, like a, the only time you get like red is when like white lights being filtered by, you know, fine dust grains, like in, uh, uh, like uh, spiral arms of a galaxy, that sort of that sort of thing. You'll you'll find that sort of red or brown. Um, but but expecting a deep red in these areas is just not what I would expect, and it's not what Startles renders. Uh, but what it does render in all cases, you know, from data sets from all sorts of different people and from all walks of life, from all different sorts of gears, all sorts of different light pollution conditions is that same sort of thing because that's, that's the emissions that are there. That's what the data is. Yeah, that's just, you know, and yeah, if, if you don't like it, you know, it's, it's, like, it's fine, you know, <laughs> you, can, you can fudge it, make, make it more red if you want to. Uh, but whether that's documentary photography, you know, it's, it's, it's a slippery slope, uh, that one. Uh, the, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll quickly touch on the other one that sort of comes up now and then with Startles. It's like, um, you know, Startles makes halos around my uh, stars. I get, I, I get that a lot. And people that have used something else like you know, the GIMP or uh, Photoshop before, and then you know start using startos they're sort of weirded out by the by actually being able to see their stellar profiles because um, and I, I showed that a little bit before in, in autodev autodev does not blow out your stars it doesn't make them in, into little discs you know it doesn't make them into little smudges it really tries it it's it's hardest to keep a well defined core at all times and stellar profiles um, that is part of your image that they're, they're actually uh, not so much in in this uh, this particular data set that we have here but if you have like a, a Newtonian for example um, the diffraction spikes um, they can they can tell you quite a bit about not only the instrument that was used you know uh, you know, the, the, the spider veins and how well it was collimated and how, you know, uh, how well the focus was uh, and all that. But it actually it can tell you about, um, you know, stellar temperatures as well and the, the spectra a little bit, just by looking at the, you know, the little rainbow patterns that, that were caused by the diffraction. Um, so they're, they're, sort of, they're sort of important and they're super handy when, uh, when you're processing actually as well having proper stellar profiles, because um, like I said in the little slide deck, there's always enough signal to noise ratio uh, in your images simply because you have stars. 
they're, they're high signal, you know, they're big and bright, you know, they're, they're often overexposed. Um, and the stellar profiles around them constitute one of the, you know, the higher signal to noise ratio areas, which is good uh, when you're doing deconvolution. Because if you're doing deconvolution, then you can actually use that as a guide because, you know, detail will start showing up. You'll start seeing diffraction patterns in those, um, uh, in those stellar profiles. They'll, they'll go from being, you know, sort of fuzzy, fuzzy halos to become, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll start showing detail um, if, you, if you spend the time uh, dialing in your settings. So they're, they're really useful, actually. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Don't, don't blow out your stars because uh, you know, not only does it, uh, you know, it's, it's destroying data, essentially. It's, it's essentially white clipping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's really, really, really useful. Cool. Uh, Okie okay, dokie. Um, there are there are questions coming in. I've uh, I'd like to cycle back a little bit. Just bear with me. Uh, okay, another uh, question from uh, from Aaron uh, as well. Actually, uh, can you save uh, at intermediate steps and pick up uh, where you left off later on? Uh, no, uh, it's it's a it's an often requested uh, feature. So I I do need to implement that. But the problem is. Maybe I can, uh, I won't show you that. Uh, maybe I can. And, yeah. Where are we? I'm sharing my screen, so that's good. Um, then I can go to, I'll, I'll show you that the, the, the problem is that the data that Startles um, keeps track of is absolutely humongous. So, <laughs> This, this is not too bad actually, but um, it's, it's constantly shifting around, um, you know, data. And if you have like bigger images, it can be multiple gigs. Um, so if you wanna save intermediate uh, states, you know, that used to be quite prohibitive. You know, things have, I guess, you know, become a bit uh, more manageable, but, uh, if you start doing that, you know, saving intermediate states, you know, it'll gobble up a lot of space really quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's compressed too. So uh, there's, there's no more compression to be had there. So that's, you know, it's half a gig for what we just processed, which, you know, it's, it's on the low side, honestly. Wow, okay, okay. So perhaps uh, in uh, future releases. Yeah, I think, I think, I think hardware is, pretty much there, you know, storage has become cheap enough. So I, I should probably read this stuff and you know, it's a, it's a totally valid um, request. Cool, okay, thank you. Um, uh, Norman says, which stars does the PSF function use? Ah, okay, so um, that's an interesting one. So what I implemented for 1.7, Historically, uh, Startles, um, Startles dealt mostly with um, atmospheric issues, uh, essentially reversing, uh, you know, the blur caused by uh, seeing related issues. So um, there, there's sort of two causes of, you know, stars not looking like perfect point lights. One is the atmosphere. Um, that we have to deal with, you know, it's turbulent and over a long exposure, it smears out um, your, uh, your nice pinpoint stars. Um, there's been a lot of research uh, done into that, on how to model that. And there's actually multiple papers on that. So I've, I've implemented for 1.7, I've implemented uh, essentially the three most used um, atmospheric models, which is by Tohio, uh, Saglia, and uh, IREF. They use uh, a different model again. This one is the default, Tohio. Um, 
I found that really, really close to what you can expect from um, atmospheric turbulence. Uh, so all you essentially have to do is, is dial in, you know, how bad your seeing was with the uh, with sort of the, the primary the primary radius in this case, which is uh, this parameter, and then it does its thing and it, it reverses it. Um, now the other thing that you know makes point lights not point lights anymore is anything optics, and I mean literally anything. Uh, because even even if you just had a tube, even a circular opening uh, causes diffraction. Uh, the uh, a, a tube causes uh, the airy disc. You may have heard of yeah. uh, diffraction. So it's yeah, it is some sort of blurring function. So anything uh, in your optical train will will cause that. And then there's troubles like you know focus and you know uh, and you could maybe your tracking isn't on point or maybe you got some field distortion going so there's there's a lot of uh, variations there um i'm just going to tell you what i'm what i'm working on right now so starting 1.7 implemented a feature where you can actually uh pass you can click on star and say, this is a good example of, um, you know, how my pinpoint light was you know, distorted. And um, using that functionality will get you slightly better results right now in, in 1.7, typically, if the, if the star sample is good. Um, so that, that is starting to take the optics into account. Um, what I'm working on right now is something called um, spatially variant deconvolution. And what that means is um, even in, in the, an amazing data set like this, you will still have from corner to corner, you will have slight variations in stellar profiles. Just because of you know tiny little errors in you know uh, in the lens, no lens is perfect. Um, you know, there may have been uh, you know, slight tracking, whatever. And the problem that you get then is that the point spread function varies depending on where you are in the image. And right now, uh, in any commercial software you can only define one point spread function for the whole image. And that is a problem because one point spread function does not typically in a real world application does not describe the actual distortion of light across the whole image. So what I'm working on uh, is a feature called spatially variant deconvolution. So that allows you to um, start setting a lot of samples uh, on stars that are that are you know uh, good candidates, and it will correct. Um, it'll, it'll it'll create models for all these stars uh, for all these different parts of the image, so every pixel will have its own point spread function essentially. So they'll reverse um, any sort of any blur function, no matter uh, uh, what it is across the whole image. Um, and that would be a first for uh, any commercially available um, deconvolution. And in the process, it does some other really, really cool things that um, put it a notch above even, even this, again, even what, what, what you've seen today. Um, it, it's doing some really cool stuff. I've, I've been trying it on pretty much any data set that I've been able to get my hands on, and I got a lot. <laughs> um, such as uh, I've been trying it on on, uh, on Hubble images, for example, and it even even corrects a whole heap of stuff there, and it it, it brings out way more detail there as well. So that's really cool. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Releasing that, it's probably going to be towards the end of the year, and, and you know that's going to be the bulk of the, the 1.8 update. Mm -hmm. 
that sounds uh, then, uh, that sounds fascinating. It, it, it is it is it is really cool. <laughs> it <just> is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it all started because uh, I've got a friend in uh, in Queensland, and he sends me data sets all the time. And I, I use a lot of his data sets for testing. And he said, "Oh, I made a boo boo. You know, um, something got caught on my uh, on my mount." And I got this this sort of trailing, you know, it's like a sort of a field rotation type sort of trailing, you know. Can you what what can you do with this? <laughs> it's like I don't really have to do this. So I spent a good few months um, just from after 1.7 was released. Uh, so that's all all I've been doing is is working on that and. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm now correcting his data sets. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Those, are, those equations must be fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can uh, I say? <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Uh, there's, been, uh, there's been a lot of chat around. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, understanding the default. Uh, uh, the default settings. I'd appreciate it. Uh, it was just a quick run through of the tools. But uh, mm. so those, when you first launch some of those, um, some of those modules, Evo, is the is the mm. default setting the uh, essentially the first one after the after the um, or, or the first option on the preset? Yeah. Is, is that what the default? Is? That that is that is generally the case. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, and then you can pick those defaults or start to fiddle with the sliders down at the bottom so that's 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 the yep that's it cool okay i hope that uh hope that clears that one up um oh there's some more comments coming at the bottom uh thanks for uh exoplanet okay uh it does deconvolute uh, de planetary mode apparently yes there is a uh okay so this not the not the demo. I do, it's just a very quick question, I think, more than anything else. Yeah, so uh, there is a planetary mode. So I just switched to lunar planetary solar. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so all of that really does actually. Uh, if you do lunar planetary and solar, um, make sure to switch de-ringing off, because um, de-ringing is it's it's mostly uh, used for uh, sort of spikes in the signal, such as for stars. Just to uh, keep them from, you know, developing these sort of panda eye effect yeah. things, um, which is not so much an issue with uh, lunar, planetary, and solar. Now you just saw this image go dark, and that's the difference between having uh, um, the the deep space version and the lunar, planetary, solar. So what this does is, it essentially, if new detail is created. Uh, because you know light is being reconcentrated into a point light, and that light has to go somewhere. And yeah, you know, um, right now with, with, with sorry with the deep space uh, setting, it's just being clipped. So you know you can't have whiter than white. Mm -hmm. But the uh, lunar planetary or solar setting um, actually reconcentrates it and uh, ups the dynamic range. So it makes other stuff darker just to accommodate the new highlights that have been recovered, um, which is definitely very useful for you know lunar stuff, particularly. Cool. Is, is there some? Um, uh, somebody just asked a question actually about uh, workflows for for planetary. Is there some stuff on the website for um, uh, for planetary workflows, Eva? Um, there, um, it is. You know. So if you go to the uh, documentation for deconvolution, it goes into planetary bit, a planetary bit. Um, you know, I don't think there's too much on planetary because the thing about Startles, uh, if, if I get more time, I'll gladly show you, is that workflows are all the same. It does not matter what it is. Okay. It doesn't matter what you, you're processing, you know, uh, Hubble images or whether you're processing from a, you know, from a mere mortal DSLR. It's the same stuff. It's the same, it's the same thing. So if you do planetary, um, it's, the considerations are roughly the same thing. Roughly you, the same probably, thing. Yeah, yeah. 
What I was just going to say at this point is I, I think we've had more chat and questions on this tour than any others. There's, there's a huge amount of <laughs> No, I think oh, that's, that's good. the way you've, the that's way awesome. you've demonstrated what star, star tools can do. It's, it's totally blown my mind. I've already uh, <laughs> just brought, brought it to myself. So <laughs> maybe we can get Evo back to do talk at a more convenient time for his uh for his time <laughs> his time zone so whether we uh, make sort of live. <laughs> more in our time zone um and bring out some of these ideas because I, I think there's there's quite a lot of people that would like to see a, a, a demonstration on a noisier data set for yeah, example yep, yep. Um, yeah yeah i mean asking about solar lunar and I wonder if we yeah. could put together some ideas and whether you'd be up for Evo doing another one of these, because otherwise I've got the yeah. feeling you could go on for several more hours. Um, oh, yeah, happily. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not trying to stop it here, but just, just you know, I think we we, we might be uh, getting quite late in the day um, or, or early yeah. in your case. Yeah, it's, it's, getting, it's getting late there, I think. So. Well, I'm just thinking yeah. we've already got a few ideas come out of this for for a kind of almost another talk in its own right. So whether we can put some other ideas together mm. Evo, and, and schedule another one of these with you, we Happy would to. love it. Yeah. I think it's it's absolutely blown my mind. I think the approach you're taking with it is so different, um, but the results speak for themselves, don't they? And it's it just looks very easy to use. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. That's it's a it's a people. That's the problem with startles is. It's literally a problem. It, it's it's so easy to use that people think it's for beginners, and the stuff that goes on is definitely not for beginners. But a beginner can use it without you know, getting into the, the, the nitty gritty of it. Mm. Yeah. I, I, to be to be totally honest, that's exactly the attitude I guess I had. I didn't appreciate what Star Tools did and how it did it. Um, mm. I think your talk is, is really shown a completely yeah. I, I'm I'm genuinely blown away, so I'm quite excited about having mm. a play with this myself. Uh, mm. Absolutely, the uh, it looks like the um, uh, uh, the idea of a, uh, another talk with Evo on on some more data sets uh, has gone down well. So that would be <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that, that that would be great. Yeah, uh, mm. and, and a, a couple more votes for the intermediate save as well, just to just to give you some focus <laughs> on uh, on future features. There we go. There I we know. Go. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, uh, okay, well, it, it is because uh, obviously we started late. It's uh, it's ten o'clock here. Not that it's an issue, um, uh, but. Mm. So that must be, uh, if that was, hey, if I, uh, I don't know, it must be breakfast. It must be breakfast time for you now, somewhere Yeah, pretty there, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope you didn't hear my stomach because it was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, should, should we do that then, Eva? Should we, should we start a discussion going with kind of areas that people, I mean, clearly a noisy data set is, is a big one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that, that we can chuck in to, to organise another talk. Um, in the yeah, show. that'd be awesome. And, and if, then, if people want to volunteer, if people want to volunteer like a, a, a noisy data set or, you know, oh, you, at you least can get about 30 data sets now. <laughs> 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 or, you know, or, or, you know if, if people have, you know, data set with a particular issue that, you know, how, how do I fix this? Or, mm. you know, or, you know, this is just noisy and I've done my best and, you know, and I've taken all the calibration frames and I've done everything. Um, and this is what it is, warts and all. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll start a topic then um, where people can either submit their data sets or volunteer their data sets, ask any more questions, and then we can try and pull that together. I suspect mm. there'll be more than one talk at the rate we're going, but <laughs> it'd be great if we can get you back on a sort of semi regular basis to, to take things a step further each time. And it sounds like you've got some amazing. Sure. You know, yeah, sure. updates come yeah. in as well so um that's oh, very exciting uh indeed uh yeah absolutely uh absolutely so um uh, just thinking about the data set so as, as long as they are uh, only calibrated um uh, and registered uh, i.e aligned we don't want any we don't want any stretching on them uh just just calibration Actually, and registration there's a uh, you know it's a shameless plug for the website, but there's on the on the website in the uh, in the links and tutorials section, yep. there yep. is a uh, a guide on you know on essentially what what to do. Uh, you know it's 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 useful even if you don't use startles, but 
a guide on what to do to create a good data set that you know uh, and will will maximize you know startles return because you know startles is is a bit more picky about certain things than than other uh, than other tools simply because you know the analysis going on it needs to real be able to rely on, on particular assumptions being met. So sure, okay. All right. Well, in that case, then we'll we'll make sure we get uh, a, a link to the website, obviously, um, um, and a link to that as well, so that um, uh, or you can just uh, copy paste that as well if you. Want. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So that we can uh, we can get that in there. So uh, um, I was just going to read out the website address, startools.org. Uh, if you've not yet had a look at it, I suspect many people have been having a look while we've been uh, uh, while we've been on air. So um, <laughs> startools.org is where you need to go. Um, Excellent. Okay. Uh, lots of thanks for that. Excellent. Good. Evo, many, many thanks for getting up so uh, so early for us. It has been absolutely fascinating um, and uh, excited to get you back again for a, for a second time in the not too distant future. My pleasure. Uh, super. Thank you. Thank you, Evo. Many thanks. Many thanks indeed. Grant, have we got a talk next week? Uh, we have, yes. Um, I'm, I'm head of the game again. Thank you. Excellent. Um, we've got um, another member talk, actually. Um, so we've got Julian O. And he's going to come and talk to us about um, unusual interstellar rockets. So it's a new talk that he was preparing um, and oh, he's, cool. he's prioritised getting it out for us, which is fantastic. But it's going to be talking about what crazy interstellar rockets, what sort of rockets or spaceships could be used to go to the distant stars. He's going to look at some of the kind of crazier designs and theories out there and, and how you could possibly turn that into a working rocket, which sounds, sounds fascinating. So I'm looking forward to that one. Has he been talking to one uh, Mr. Musk or something? Is he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, radio. Uh, in that case, then we will close it there. Evo, many, many thanks again. Startools.org is where you need to go to, um, everyone, to go and find out more. And, and we will see you all uh, next week. Evo, many, many thanks. Have a Thank great you. day. Yeah, cheers, Evo. Thanks Thank very you. much. Night, night, everybody. Thank you all.